Oh yeah, there we go. I'm now zooming from Cape Town to Belle Paris, uh, the wonderful city of Paris, and you can see sunshine streaming in there into the uh, apartments and offices of Kelsey Crawford uh, and uh, Antonin Antonin Mainu, Mainu. Who, are, who are both uh, at uh, Cutwork Studio in Paris. Bonjour, bienvenue, hello, how are you? Bonjour, bonjour, merci Nils, merci. Thanks for Hi. having us. Yep, we're here, we're happy. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's all we want. That's all we want, being here and being happy. Um, guys, tell me a bit about, or tell us a bit about uh, um, Cutwork Studio. What, what do you guys do in a, in a nutshell before we go into a little bit more granular detail? All right, so in a nutshell, we are an architecture and design studio uh, focused on new ways to live and work. And maybe Kels, you want to say more? Yeah, and so what that means is we're kind of working on pro projects that are all reimagining the future of living and working spaces. That's really our, our interest. So we're not really doing any traditional residential, traditional office, but really focused on how with uh, socioeconomic changes, uh, the family structure is changing, how the world post COVID is changing and what this means for how we design uh, hospitality spaces, how we design residential spaces uh, and really working on this blur between hospitality and residential, which we kind of are moving into, which we call service living, yeah. uh, which is really a hybrid, hybridization of a lot of different categories. That's really our bread and butter. That's what we, what we really spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, and we're, we've worked on quite a few large scale co-living projects. Um, and one of our, one of our big interests today is also offsite modular construction and how this is influencing, uh, the sectors of service living. Yep. Right. Cool. Now let's go straight into it because as you said, blurs, uh, I mean, we, and we've seen that in the pandemic, uh, uh, you know, service living, um, um, um and, 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 uh, um, hotel rooms that were larger that allowed us to do more things in them or whatever you were definitely the winners out of this pandemic and uh, um, they did they did pretty well as opposed to the uh, traditional hotel room and uh, um, in, in in our chat a few weeks ago Kelsey when we first met um, I was talking about sort of my little passion uh, when I look at hotel rooms and let's go straight into that particular part there with uh, with the hotel room the hotel room hasn't really changed has it um, over the past 60, 80 years. I think the only thing that has changed meaningfully was the flat screen TV that came up um, that saved the hotelier and uh, the owner a couple of square meters because, um, you know, we don't have to have these big boxes where the deep TVs were in. But otherwise, it hasn't really changed meaningfully. There are a couple of things that uh, some brands have done or some uh, innovators, but where would you see is a change possible? Is a change needed? Uh, mm. um, and what is your experience in, in, in that to, to change it, to make it more adaptable to make it sexier, whatever mm. the terms might be, Antonin or, or Kelsey. Yeah, so that. basically we, we, we talk about that quite often with Kelsey actually. Um, the, the drama somehow of a hotel bedroom is that you enter in the bedroom and you see the bed and you see one chair and you see one tablet and basically you know exactly what you can do in that room. Your brain is, it's finished within your brain. The, uh, the capacity of the space is kind of finished. And somewhere, good, great architecture unlocks something in your mind of what you can do there. So we believe that these usages need to be more reconfigurable. Um, in the Japanese world, I'm half Japanese and half French. And in the Japanese uh, world, um, there is, we, we name a room, a basic room, washitsu. And the washitsu is basically a room that has no prefigured uh, um, recon uh, configuration. So it's a tatami room. And basically you take, a low table and low chairs and it becomes a dining room or a breakfast room uh, you take that out you take the tatami you unroll it and then it becomes the bedroom so it's kind of a generic room that you can just adapt into whatever usage you have and so for us um i wouldn't rec recommend like a formal change per se but a kind of a that type of philosophy of the japanese adaptable space and translate that into the hospitality and see what kind of creative thing it unlocks into designers who are specialized in that now that all goes into the uh, um, what uh, people call as limbless is more, uh, you know, you make things more compact or whatever you. Um, uh, I personally like that. I mean, I do have way too much stuff, so I'm not quite there yet with the with the, with the limb aspect and the minimalizing. Um, um, but uh, what you're saying makes absolute sense. But why aren't people doing this already? Why isn't um, 
why isn't your office 15 times bigger and you're designing for mm. all the big chains something which I as a guest might really enjoy because it is that adapt adaptability. Uh, don't, don't worry, we're, we're coming, we're coming, we're arriving. <laughs> <laughs> but like, um, well, actually we are doing that, maybe Kelsey. Well, I think if I can just rebound sort of on the previous question, one of the interesting things about the design work that we're doing is we're looking at how a space can transform for different use usages, depending on different times of the day, depending on different needs of the users. And so one of the elements that we did in our latest project Tully Room is we created a bed that could disappear into the ceiling when it's not in use. And we also created a kitchenette that can disappear or reappear when it's needed or when it's not needed. And I think as we're talking about this blur between uh, hospitality and residential, the kitchenette and the kitchen itself has a large role to play. And we understand in the hospitality sector that when we add a kitchenette to a project, uh, we increase the total length of stay uh, pretty substantially by guests. But then um, at, actually during the, the panel in, in Berlin at IHIF, um, uh, the Eden Hotel Group had a very interesting thing to say about this, but once we increase the length of stay, we have to change the cultural programming because what happens when we increase the length of stay is people want to interact more, they want more activities, they want to meet people more. So it's really, a, it's a complicated puzzle that we're looking at, but what we're seeing is a trend towards longer stay. Uh, towards more local integration and towards a bedroom that can serve as multiple functions, as an office, as a gym, as a place to host friends. And for us, our core work is really around how do we create this kind of ideal compact block that can then move from yeah. different usages. And this is where we see a lot of value. And for us, this is kind of the new luxury. Uh, and I think there's a new subset of, of travelers and of residents who see luxury more in freedom, in flexibility, in the ability to transform a space in real time for what they need, rather than luxury as a set of material specifications or access to a, a market of people who, who are typically inaccessible. Um, I think that's a big, that's a big change. And just to, to finish on your first first question, one of the things that we see, you know, we've been into this since the very beginning of our company, our tagline is together has changed. Uh, and we're really focused on how the family structure is changing. Therefore, uh, the way we share space is changing, uh, and especially in the context of shared living. Uh, and I think what we have been presenting as a design philosophy for five, six years now is that spaces should be built with this idea in mind to be transformed for different usages, to be thought of from the beginning with a certain flexibility. You know, we were sort of preaching to a very small choir, you know, co-living operators understood this, but the, the general public at large thought, you know, why do we need such spaces? And then what happened during COVID is that everyone for two years was forced to live in their small space that wasn't thought of to be transformed for multiple usages. And suddenly you're having to work from home, having to cook and eat uh, as your restaurant all the time, maybe raise your kids in your home, all of your sports, all of the activities need to be in the home. So I think everyone had sort of a shock of, wow, if only this table was thought of to be used <laughs> to be able to be easily transformed between eating and working. If only I could transform my living room into a yoga studio when I need it to be that or a place yeah. to have my kids. So I think suddenly uh, it became much more visceral what we were doing and much more obvious. And I think the hotel industry also is really listening uh, and we're seeing a lot of evolution and changes, not just under the umbrella of co-living, but taking notes from that and applying it to more traditional hotel or traditional residential. Yeah, I mean, as you said, Anthony, the, uh, the, 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 the person's pre-programmed when you walk into a traditional hotel room and, uh, you know, the bed by, uh, by definition is, uh, um, you know, is a four square meter block exactly. that is blocking, that is blocking uh, um, my... Uh, freedom to move, uh, yeah. um, it's blocking everything and then also um, probably subliminary and I haven't studied that, uh, it tells me uh, I should be sleeping <laughs> or I should be, uh, mm -hmm. you know, or it's unmade, I need to make it but I mean the housekeeping hasn't been in yet and whatever so uh, um, and uh, you have in the poly room you moved it against the ceiling, uh, um, I have been advocating and uh, um, you know as I shared with you Kelsey some people look at me and laugh and say <laughs> you know I wonder, <coughs> what, what happened to what happened to the Murphy bed you know, to move the bed up and underneath comes out the desk or whatever. There's so many uh, uh, concepts now, which I would definitely prefer because when I room, when I work in my room and unfortunately traveling as much as I do, I have to often work in the room and it's 
unless I get an upgrade somewhere, uh, you know, and I get a suite, uh, um, beautiful. But otherwise, a normal hotel room doesn't never invite me to to work. Um, no. And yes, I love co-working. I love being in a in a in a in a, in a cool space. And I want to come back to that in a minute with other people. But there are moments when you have a conference call like this. It's better to do this kind of thing in an office where there is not 15 people shouting and then the barista making coffee and whatever. You. That yes. is cool when you're working on something, but not when you have this the, the, these kind of calls. Um, the uh, um, Kelsey, you mentioned the um, uh, sharing and uh, um, and doing more things. Uh, um, and, uh, sorry, the length of stay. That was my uh, my hope. Mm -hmm. Length of stay also means when you want to share something that you need to not only have rooms that offer me more freedom and more flexibility and more uses, but it also means that I need to probably increase my uh, public areas in a way and make and, and activate them, don't I? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And then we need to understand some sort of perhaps facilitation from the operator, from whether it's a hotel or a co-living, how are residents meeting each other? Because one of the key insights was that once you increase the length of stay, you're also going to increase the likelihood that the guest is going to become lonely at some point during their stay. And how do we address this as a hotel operator or as a shared living operator? Well, if you want to create a sticky atmosphere for this for this uh, client to come back again and again, you try to fulfill this need. So how is this need met? Is it that you have uh, social spaces that offer services like yoga, like meditation, wellness? Uh, is it that you have mixers or cocktails? Is it, you know, how do you actually create this uh, stickiness between your guests? And so this is a whole nother level of things to think about, which come into the much more complex uh, range of operation that co-living operators are used to navigating. Now, um, when I looked at your website, uh, deviating slightly from, from, from this subject now, um, because we could talk about this forever, and I would love to uh, one day really meet you in, in real life and, uh, and uh, share those, uh, um, those insights over uh, coffee, wine, wine, wine sounds good. <laughs> um, uh, in, on your website, you got architecture, furniture, manufacturing. Um, you're covering everything? Are you a one-stop shop <laughs> or uh, are we trying to be everything to everybody or how does that how does that work? I mean furniture I get because the multi-use will have to be somehow designed. Yes uh, yeah we do exactly that we do the architecture part which is kind of the envelope the programming the vertical circulation the typology the morphology of the building the insertion within the the urban context or the rural context and the landscape um, then we do the interior, which means uh, really the materiality, the functionality, the multifunctionality, the usages, um, the amenagement, the layout, this kind of element, the bedroom typologies. And then we do the manufacturing because we kind of have a, a background into um, manu chaos. Maybe if you can talk about that. I can find a, a sample. And I'll, yeah, I'll of it. course. So the thing that makes our studio a little bit particular uh, from most architecture and design studios is that we really have a few hats. Uh, Anto, after he did architecture school in Paris, he went to Les Arts et Métiers, which is an engineering school, where he patented uh, a technology that allows metallic tubes to be cut and scored and then bent by hand, around which we develop uh, custom furniture and lightweight architectural structures for many of our projects. So what this, what this also means is that our reflexes are in the factory. Um, you can see here. Yeah. So we're, 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 we're kind of as, ease at, 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 as much at ease working on a site as we are in a factory. And it's been that way for the last decade. Uh, it's a different language that an architect or a designer is speaking when you're designing something to be industrial produ industrially produced at scale. Yeah. For our first co-living project in Paris, we designed 16 pieces of custom furniture and over 5,000 elements in total for a 600-bed co-living project that could be, um, from the time the client made the first down payment, produced and delivered within eight weeks. Wow. So we're really interested in this uh, balancing act between how, we're, how is something uh, sensual and handmade and thought of from a very tactical perspective, yet conceived to be able to touch volume and mass on an industrial scale. So this yeah. sounds quite like a paradox, um, but it's really the line that we're holding as a studio uh, and what we're, what we're really interested in. And so naturally offsite construction and looking at building modular uh, is something that comes sort of in our DNA, uh, right. and it's an, yeah. it's an exploration. 
Mm -hmm. Can you show that? So this is sure. these metallic, uh, you, you talked about it, yeah? Am I right? Yeah. 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 The metallic tubes and you cut them with the laser cutting machine and then you can bend it like that by hand. Oh. And so this allows you to build all kinds of stuff. Uh, noticeably, we've built uh, refugee housings with this kind of solution to make kind of uh, housing kit. So basically you send flat all these tubes and then the people uh, just built into shape the structure and, and, and stick the them into each other exactly and mm -hmm. i can show you just a piece of furniture if you want <laughs> <laughs> i like that it's just really yeah uh, really but, interactive I, I, talk. but i think oh, cool. that um Easy. cool I think one thing, one, one thing that we also do is, uh, and our third partner who is based in Amsterdam is a graphic designer. And so we do have a lot of opinions and a lot of uh, value to add also from a branding perspective. So we like um, the kind of partnerships we're looking for, the kind of projects we're looking for is really coming in at the beginning of a brand's life cycle, so helping we... develop the, the brand from the ground up. Um, that's what we did with Wig Immobilier, with uh, the new co-living brand that's going to be deployed in around 10 sites in Paris, mm -hmm. or excuse me, in France, um, and really coming in from the ground up to define the scaling structure, to define the architectural guidelines, the interior guidelines, and the brand can't be separated from that. I think the mistake that many brands make uh, is they do all of the work with a designer and architect, and then they have another company sort of come in and place the brand on top of it. And sometimes they don't really meld that well. Right. All you know, too you often. can you, all, all too often. So when when you're thinking about it from the beginning, you're all in the same process. It's easier to come up with something that feels more cohesive. And so, uh, yeah, we're definitely working towards being sort of a one-stop shop, if you will, of being yeah. a. A, a global brand and design partner for the yeah. brands that we're building. Uh, as, 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 as we agreed last time we chatted, uh, you know, I, I personally see lots of synergies there between us as well. Um, time is running out. Uh, in fact, it has <laughs> run out, but we've got two guests, so we are allowed to go a little bit over. Um, we're already taking care by reducing the space because we now have got, you know, uh, an off. In, let's go back to hotels. We've got an office and a bedroom and a meeting room in one. So we reduce space. So we've done uh, one part already um, um, to help with sustainability aspect. Um, the materials you use, um, the uh, um, um, the poly room that uh, I will, by the way, I put a link in, in, into the post as well to the poly room because I, I find it incredibly interesting and 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 uh, I'd love to place one in the in the backyard and uh, you know and live there. Um, Sustainability. What? What? Apart from reducing the space and therefore reducing uh, um, wastage of, of materials and whatever you, um, what else are we doing with um, sustainability while we're looking at the model that uh, Anton is showing mm -hmm. us? Here? Yeah. So this, I, I can speak about maybe a bit of sustainability and um, also biodiversity because I'm, I'm a bird watcher personally, and I, I, I care a lot about that idea that um, basically we're sharing territories with other types of being that sapiens. And that is a key element to uh, our understanding uh, of our biosphere and our environment. Uh, this is not only about energy. This is also about the understanding of other beings uh, and how we treat about that. Uh, I'm just showing you just real quick. This is a, a, the basic model. The first one we did, it's a bit broken now, but yeah, uh, in a, a for poly room. So this is what you see here. You have the bathroom, you have a kitchen at here that you can kind of hide away with a system that slides like this. And here on that spot, you have the, the bed that can go up and down and that reveals uh, when, it, when the meter squares of the, the bed uh, are taken away, basically on the ceiling, you reveal a sofa and then you have that whole space becomes an any type of space, uh, rather a dining space, rather a, a party space, rather a meeting space, rather a workspace, whether whatever space you'd like to do. And the other thing that we've implemented is that facade system that has a, an extension of a, a small balcony and half of it is a big planter with a... Um, a, a planting growing system with all the automatized uh, watering system and all this and that creates that type of building at the end wow. uh, and so the idea is that really you, you you build a building as if you were planting a tree basically that activates the biodiversity and that uh, you know interacts between uh, um, well the birds for my part uh, and the and the humans there and this is a sign that uh, the biosphere is doing better somehow that's kind of the idea and I then so that so that's one, one side of it. And then the second, the, the more engineering part of it, let's say, uh, this is all about material selection. Uh, one of the things we do, for example, is use 
uh, mycelium for floor. Uh, we use a brand called Mogu uh, that does this. That they do flooring that is completely um, organic uh, because it's it's grown mushrooms that do the floor. Um, also, we use completely recycled um, uh, uh, steel with the, the the manufacturing factory, which uh, allows to really really reduce a lot the impact uh, uh, the carbon impact of the construction, uh, which is extremely important with an industrial scale uh, construction. Uh, the other thing that we do is we really insulate extremely well the buildings uh, and we use uh, uh, heat pumps, basically, which are really uh, the most efficient way to, uh, to heat yeah. and also to cool a place. So that's the idea. I really wish we would have another hour at least, but we don't. Um, I say a big, big thank you. Um, I got a funny feeling we'll be chatting again. Um, <laughs> and I'm looking, I'm looking forward to that. And uh, Thank you very, very much for your time, Kelsey Crawford, uh, Cutwood Studio, and Anton Omaino. Thank you so much for your time. All Thank the you. very, very best. And I hope yep. that many, many people uh, listen to you, listen to your input, uh, because I see a lot of um, positivity coming out there and, and, and really an impact that we, uh, you know, that uh, will, will be positive for the environment, positive for the built environment as well that we work in and live in. Thank you so Thank much you so and much. have a wonderful day. Merci. Thank you a lot. Bye-bye. Have a Thank good day. Thank you Bye -bye. so much. Thank you.